We're here in Geneva, in Switzerland, at the Overcoming Inequalities in a Fractured World Conference hosted by the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. I had the pleasure to speak with some of the speakers. Hello, my name is Sudhish. I'm a DPhil candidate at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. I'm from India and that is where my research is based. I work on the land and livelihood struggles in uh, the district of Wayanad in the state of Kerala. In India, indigenous peoples are called Adivasis and this particular community is that of the Paniyas. It is a community which has a past of bonded labor under you know, uh, feudalism in the pre-independence period and which continued well into post-independence era. Large majority of them live below the poverty line and land has been one of their most important demands. In the local society, in India, you know, there are caste hierarchies and the indigenous peoples also figure in the caste hierarchy at, at the bottom. So I try to understand how different communities vie with each other for power over land, for control over land, and how that impacts the struggles of the Panya community for land. How is the situation? What are the main problems they are facing? As an ethnographer, I try to look at a very micro level picture of what is happening and try to draw some common lessons for you know the larger Indian society. But of course, I mean, India is so diverse that it's not directly generalizable. So in my research, what I found is that because of agrarian changes, there is a disappearing agriculture. At the same time, there is increasing urbanization. And on the other hand, I mean, the third thing that is happening is new avenues of capital accumulation, which in simple terms mean new kinds of businesses coming up, including the planting of cash crops in plantations for big businesses. And the community that I'm working with are working as laborers in all of these. So what I found is that in the middle of all these changes that are happening in that particular place, the Paniya community is getting expelled from all these livelihood sources for various reasons. They are expelled from the site of ginger farming, which is a cash crop. Uh, they are being replaced by even more marginalized communities who ask for a fraction of the wages that the Panyas ask for. There is a lot of nature tourism, resorts coming up, but the Panya community do not get any kind of livelihood in those sites. Agriculture is disappearing, so the traditional paddy labor skills that they had uh, no longer has any takers. Why did you decide to study this community? So the place that I come from, Kerala, is, is known in you know, development studies literature, social science literature, as this exception in India with full of uh, social development, high literacy, everybody is politically active, very low infant mortality at birth, um, you know, positive sex ratio, more women than men and so on and so forth. All that is partially true, but there is also this story. And, and for me, it's like, you know, engaging with, you know, my environment where I live with. And I know that as a person who's, who's privileged in terms of, you know, uh, caste, class, gender, ability and so on. Every interview that I do is part of questioning my own privileges as well uh, and understanding that situation, uh, my own story better through that. Why ethnography? I'm not a traditional trained anthropologist. So I worked on the Forest Rights Act way back in 2012. And then, I mean, some of the questions were coming into my mind, you know, why land? How do people see land in this changing environment? Is land a property for them? Is land an asset? Is it a, a symbol of power? So I was interested in knowing the meanings that people themselves attributed to land. And the only methodology that I found, you know, uh, that I can help is ethnography, which is just being in, with the community, listening to them, asking questions, but also not asking many questions uh, and just observing what, what, what is happening. And my disappointment is that, I mean, it's still not ethnographic enough, you know, it, it will take years and years to call it uh, and ethnography really because I hold that method on a high level but again I mean one has to acknowledge that ethnography itself came from you know colonial anthropologists uh, trying to uh, identify indigenous peoples as primitive and so on and so forth it has that baggage and it has to be questioned at every stage of using that method I realized that Walking could be used as a method, which is basically traveling with them around their uh, surroundings and environment, where they actually show you that, you know, the paddy farms are disappearing. 
you know we are losing jobs there because the cash crops that are coming in do not require labor as much as the paddy farms did so just moving around with them could be you know a method what has changed over the last 20 years for the community 20 years ago of course i mean landlessness was extreme of late i mean there are social protection programs especially you know public distribution of food there is the national rural employment guarantee scheme which is again a public funded employment guarantee program there is also the forest rights act which has given a few of these paniya households titles over some land so there are a large a lot of money is spent on the entire machinery of the scheduled tribe department to help them but i mean corruption is rampant of course and you know even when um, social protection programs are implemented it does not really take into account the fact that it's not compensatory for the livelihood losses happening to them you know the livelihood losses that i just mentioned uh, nrega uh, the rural employment guarantee wages are not enough to survive the whole year and i found families after families having only this one source of income an interesting observation was that midway through my field work one of the villages got so urbanized that it was called a town from then on from you know uh, uh, a particular point which means that the rural employment guarantee scheme stopped functioning because it's now an urban area so that one source of livelihood that these families had was also gone so while compared to say 20 years ago uh, there are more social protection uh, measures there are also new kinds of insecurities that are coming up and the situation is getting more and more complex how do the people feel about their situation i mean i would take the case of the recent floods that happened in kerala in this site the pani as a community that i worked with live in uh, ghettos called colonies which is a tiny site uh, with as many as 20 to 25 households crammed in uh, in little pieces of land so the, when the floods came they were the first ones who were affected uh, because they had nowhere to go and if, when i when i spoke to them you know what what was happening the first thing that they said was that there's no work and i had to really plead them that you first make yourself i mean safe and what they said is quite understandable because for them what really matters is you know work from day to day you know to move from one day to another and that is what really bothers them so there is so much livelihood insecurity that any shock that comes any say a flood that comes affects these communities the most what impressed you the most what many academics would think of indigenous peoples you know indigenous peoples are you know romantically linked to land and forest which is i mean they have a historic relationship with land and they are fighting for strug- i mean uh, for their rights over this but you know they are they are so articulate about how that context is changing how agriculture is changing how forest is being opened up for big businesses in the form of tourism and so on that they want their rights in relation with this changed environment so they are very uh, articulate and clear that when they ask for rights over land it is not a very static understanding of simple communal rights over land but rights which are in tune with the changing times everything goes back to landlessness um it's it's one of the striking things is that what they are asking for is not more welfare social protection say unemployment insurance or anything but this concrete entity called land um for them poverty is linked to the lack of ownership over land uh, any other issue i mean there's high level of morbidity and you know they they find clear ways of how it is linked to land land is also a uh, social power in 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 the rural context and interestingly once you have land you can convert it into other privileges for instance if you have land i mean you can use it as collateral um you know to get a bank loan and start a business maybe but i mean in the, in this context uh, the banks actually frown upon uh, indigenous people's land if at all they earn it but then i mean they can produce something and saves enough to educate their uh, kids in school and once that is done you know these children go on to occupy positions in public employment in india we have uh, affirmative action for indigenous communities so once the children are educated they can go into public employment but if you don't own land you can't convert it into any other kinds of privileges so at every stage you know you are excluded from uh, social mobility if we can use that term if they don't earn land in their own articulation what they need is land redistribution and that is very different from 
land distribution. Uh, this is one of the lessons from my research that parceling out vacant pieces of land to people is not going to help. You know, when you give land, it has to be in accordance with the changing times. You have to, uh, you know, provide people with know-how and, you know, they are demanding it themselves. Uh, the know-how of what to farm, how to farm, how to market it, how to invest in agriculture and, you know, how to convert land into an asset. When land is distributed right now, titles are given, but these titles are basically certificates of temporary possession uh, on which people who get the land have very limited rights so they, they are afraid of even you know cutting a branch of a tree from their own land so they really ask for substantive you know user rights on on the land and this is what comes up in the sustainable development goals as well uh, one of the targets is to provide titles over land properly recognized titles over land we need to understand what title means and what properly recognized titles mean uh, from the perspective of the people, it is that kind of a title which, which ensures that they are able to fully use it to improve their own lives. Why do they not own land? Historically, I mean, it has been a landless community and before independence under the feudal structure, they were uh, bonded laborers without land. Uh, if at all some, some people owned land, there were waves of migration of more affluent communities into this place called Vainad from the plains. So Vainad is up the hills. So other communities came up the hills and this was a time, these are the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, 1940s to 60s when there were no clear titles. So it was easy to uh, take away lands from uh, Adivasis, indigenous peoples. So a lot of land alienation happened during that period. The state is also to blame to some extent because laws that were made to take back those alienated lands were not implemented because of course the more affluent communities had more power and more bargaining power with the state and they ensured that you know these laws did not actually work land reforms were implemented in the state in the 1970s but how these communities were left out of that story so again i mean historically at every stage they have been excluded from any effort to be provided with land what is the role that researchers can play in your opinion in very simple terms, they are in search of data, you know, concrete data from databases, government offices and so on, which can substantiate their claims. And, you know, researchers when they are in the field really have the privilege and the time to go into government offices. They have the privilege of, you know, having that uh, identity card from, you know, a big university. And also in my case, you know, I was an Indian citizen, so I could file these right to information requests with government offices. And rather than apply our theoretical frameworks, you know, to analyze them, we can really listen to them and, and question ourselves, you know, what are our assumptions about, you know, other people, people who we have othered in many ways. And are we, reproducing that otherness through research you know how do we question that at every stage of our research how do we question the way we write about people you know is the language that we use really representative of the way they see themselves and all this has to be done without claiming to represent them uh, without trying to be their voice because you know they don't need you to be uh, their voice why are you so passionate about this why are you doing this it would be cliche to say that, you know, I'm excited about, I mean, you know, bringing a transformative change because, of course, transformative social change is what is required. But I can see um, that it, it is a lot about, you know, where I come from and, you know, it helps me question myself as well. It, it is about understanding yourself by looking at people around you and, you know, where you are placed in, in those social structures of power hierarchies and why they are like that. Why do they continue to be like that? What motivates you? I still feel that, you know, I have only understood the tip of the iceberg. You know, the big stories are, you know, still to be understood. You know, the power structure as it functions, how is this thing called caste really transforming its colors and, you know, uh, true nature uh, 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 along with the grading changes and the changing times. There is a lot to be explored in that. And, you know, every time I try to write something, I understand that, you know, there's a whole world which I haven't un um, explored yet. There's a whole universe that I need to understand. And, yeah, I think that keeps me going. What kind of society do you dream of? What kind of society do I look forward to? I think it, it is clear in this case that it has to be a bit more equal, a place where social justice works for everyone. 
and there is no reason why in 2018 the panya community should not own land and be at the same standard of life if you call it as the others it it is a great injustice that we are able to live with it you know and not question is it enough in 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 say 2018 i mean i feel like you know i i i always have this feeling that time is running out and we are not doing enough so i i look forward to a time when they are able to have all the rights that they want because there is no reason why they should not what is the most important lesson or message you have learned here at the conference i think uh, i so i heard a bunch of papers and it, i mean the nicest thing about the conference was that you know there is there are these sustainable development goals all the lofty talk about it you know high level vocabulary and i was asked this question actually you know do your people actually talk about sustainable development goals and i said they do not but you know there are still many things in their narratives which can question the sustainable development goals and the targets what do access over resources actually mean and there were many papers which did this work of you know going at the ground level and telling us what growth or development actually looked like at the grassroots level that kind of constructive criticism will only help us in in uh, questioning our own narrative of development so to speak and improving it and making it work for a little more number of people thank you so much for this conversation thank you thank you so much for watching thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for sharing next time we are going to continue with our mini series about inequalities i hope to see you soon again bye and ciao